Hello and welcome to this special edition tech tip. My name is Jesse. Now our standard tech tips are just a few short minutes long. So this week I decided to do a special edition tech tip, which will be quite a bit more involved. In the past couple of weeks, we've taken a look at a couple of techniques using this model of a cam gear. If you've missed those videos, take a moment to check them out using the links on the screen. This tip will be about 30 minutes long and it will take you through the entire process I used to get this seemingly impossible animation created. Along the way, we'll take a look at the whole assembly setup and what techniques I used to create the motion we needed for this project I call the Great Belt Illusion. So thanks for watching Cat Dimensions Tech Tips and I hope you enjoy this episode. To start, let's look at the positioning of these pulleys. Now in this case, I created a part that just has a sketch in it. And this sketch gives me the locations of the pulleys. I thought this would be the easiest, and truth be told, I actually just sketched over an image and roughed in these dimensions. I couldn't find the actual dimensions quickly, and for me, this is a game where the points don't matter. I'm just here to show you guys some techniques and how you can apply these things. Now the reason why I went with a dashed line here in the middle is to actually give this tensioner some flexibility and we'll see how that plays a role when we get to the top level assembly but I've placed a location for the top gears the crank gear and I've left some degrees of freedom open for a tensioner now back in the assembly again I've just used my profile center mate to place these components in line with my sketch that tells me where those gears are supposed to be now again with the tensioner I just applied a parallel as well as a coincident of a point onto that sketch and you'll see that this tensioner pulley can now move along this angle. Now this can be an arc that your tensioner may move in, whatever degree of freedom this pulley would have naturally in the system. Now the first thing that we want to do is to create some relationship between all of these components so that they spin at the appropriate speed in comparison to one another. But before I do that, I actually want to kind of eyeball things and get them as close as I can to matching up with where the belt is going to land. To do that, we'll just move to our front view. And I know that the belt is going to come across the top, so I'll just make sure that there is a valley, uh, however you want these set in their orientation. I'll just set them so that there is a valley somewhere along close to the top. Now I'm going to come back and have to move these anyway, but this just gives me an idea of where they might be. We want to line these up on top, wherever they are supposed to be positioned. We could also use a mate at this time to get those positioned. Now the red rings that we see here, these are simply the sketches that were used to create these components in the first place. I've just changed their sketch color to highlight these. This will become more apparent why I've done this in just a moment. We'll move down here, so this will come along. Again, in this case, this will wrap. I'll just make this close to lined up here with this tooth. And likewise in the bottom, this will wrap out around here. Again, I just need these close. With that in place, let's go ahead and apply the relationship between all of these pulleys and gears. To do this, I'll move to the assembly tab and under assembly features, I'll use the belt and chain tool. Once the belt and chain tool is launched, I need to make my selections for what components will be included. Now again, here's where I've used these sketches to my advantage. I now have an easy reference for each one of these and I'm okay with the belt just coming to the top not penetrating down into these roots because we'll be adding that later. So I'll select these components and as soon as I select more than one you can see the belt starting to add in with the position for each pulley. We'll move down to this one, the idler and the crank. Now we see the idler is going the wrong way. We can fix this from the properties pane or we can just select the arrow. Now we see that I've got the belt in the appropriate shape but there's a couple more things that I want to do before we exit out. The next selection down is the belt location plane. I'm going to place this all the way on the back. So I'll rotate my model around and in this selection box 
I'll just select one of these back faces. You can see that moves the belt all the way to the back. Then I can add some thickness forward in just a moment. Now the next selection box down, we see that we have some properties for the belt itself. Now this checkbox is a very interesting one and this is specifically why I chose to leave the tensioner unrestrained. The system as it sits now has a belt that's 1,872.6401701.6 millimeters long. So of course we'll just go down to the store and we'll buy a belt that's 1,872.64017. That's not going to happen, <laughs> of course. So we need to drive this belt to a standard length. Now again, I've made up all of these numbers, so we'll say we'll just move this to a round value. Now as soon as I check driving, this box becomes lit and we can now control the length of this belt, which will move the positions of the components to accommodate. This does of course require that you have some degrees of freedom open in the assembly for components to move on, otherwise you'll be over constraining the model. We'll put that in and our belt is now being driven at this value. Now again, if we make changes to this, We'll see that pulley location update. To accommodate that change. Again, we'll go with 1900. We have a couple more check boxes down here and I'm actually going to use both. Now this option here will allow us to add in a belt thickness. This will do a mid plane thickness surrounding the path. So if we say, okay, we'll use this, we'll add in a thickness. Uh, we'll add, go with five millimeters. That should be enough to be clear to see. We'll see that this will stand off by half of that value. Now, the reason why it does half is because it's not sure what side of the belt it might be on at any given time. Here at the top, this side of the belt, uh, if we offset entirely this way, would be the bottom surface. But by the time we got around down here to the idler, again, that surface would be the opposite. So mid plane allows it to go both directions and have that offset be appropriate. We do want to engage the belt. This will drive the components. And I'm also going to use this last option to create a belt part. And what this will do is we'll create a new component within the assembly specifically for the belt. We'll say okay to that and now we can accept. So here's what we've done. You can see that there's been a sketch that's been added at the midpoint of five millimeters surrounding the components where the belt would go. If we look towards the bottom, we see now under the mates folder, we now have a belt of a given length. Now, if we expand this out here, we can see the belt component that has been added for us and the sketch for that's path. Now at this point we have essentially a working model. If I come over into the assembly and I start moving things around, you can see that these components will move and will rotate in the ratios based on their size, given what I've selected. So if simple motion is all we're looking for, we've already accommodated that. I've never been happy with simple motion. I always want more. So let's continue on to get back to that point that we saw towards the beginning. In order to do that, I'm going to make a physical part that represents the belt itself. Now again, the belt isn't creating that motion. It's the actual belt assembly feature that's creating that motion. But I want this to look a little bit more realistic. In order to do that, I'm going to edit in context this belt component. So from within the assembly, I'll say edit part and this allows me to work on this part within the context of the assembly. Now I've got this convenient path here. I'm going to use that to create a sweep in order to generate the 3D representation of my belt. Before I get too carried away, there's one thing that I want to check. Up until now, everything has been in millimeters, though I notice my new part is in inches. So I'm going to go down and change this set of units right over to millimeters. And the reason why that came in as inches is because my default template is set to my inch template. 
This is an option in the settings, but given this is already a complicated tech tip, I'll leave that for another day. From here, I want to create a profile for my path. In order to do that, we'll find a plane, maybe the right plane, and I'll create a plane parallel to this at this point, since it seems like a convenient spot to start. I'll use my shortcut holding the control key and dragging off the edge of the plane to generate a new plane and I'll select as my second reference this vertex. From here we can start a sketch on this plane and we'll create the shape of the belt. Again this is the midpoint so I'll select the midpoint of this rectangle and that point on my path. This was a five millimeter belt and we'll move back to normal. Now we can see that lands properly at the top of my gear and we just have to set the width. To do that, I'll just reference one of the gears and make that collinear. Once I'm set, I can exit my sketch. I'll use my confirmation corner. Now again, we are in the context of the assembly, but I still have access to all of my features. So move to the features tab. They've just been shifted over slightly by my assembly options, but I still have my sweep. Moving into my sweep, it's already selected my profile. Next, I just need to select my path. I'll use my selection manager off of the right click and select a closed loop. With my profile and my path selected, you can see we have a preview of the solid representation of this belt. So far, so good. We'll say OK, and there we have it. From here, I can exit editing the component. Again, I'll use my confirmation corner, and now we're back to editing the assembly. Now this belt, though it is a virtual component, I can still open on its own. And we can see here is the part that represents that belt. I'm going to create a new sketch in this belt part that will represent the inside face of this belt. The next step is going to be to add the teeth in and I need something for these teeth to follow. We'll flip this over and I'll start a sketch on the back from here, we'll just convert entities, and we'll grab, whoops, we don't want offset entities, we want to convert entities. From here, we'll accept, and now we have a sketch representing the inside of that belt. and we'll exit sketch. Now I'll also give this a color just so we can easily see it from within the assembly. So I'll move to sketch color. I'll create this as yellow. Okay. Let's move back to the assembly. Now that I've gotten back to the assembly, I realized that I've used the wrong face to create that sketch. Why don't we use this as a learning experience? What I may have done was selected the component and used this option for open part in position. What this would have done is opened the component in the same orientation as it was in the assembly. This might have prevented me from getting disoriented when I opened this component in its own window. Though this shouldn't be too much of a problem. I'll move back to the sketch and we'll say edit sketch plane and we'll move that to the back face. I'll use my D key from breadcrumbs to say OK and accept. And we fixed my error. An unexpected tip within a tip. From here, I may go back and hide the original belt path since I have one very close to it now that I might need to select. 
The next step in this process is going to be to add in the tooth. Now the tooth I made as its own component, and the reason why I did this is because of course the belt itself cannot move. We can't have this type of flexibility within SolidWorks components and animate that. So what we want to do is create the illusion that this belt is moving, and in order to do that, I'll use the component chain pattern introduced in 2015. Let's insert that component. Here you can see the little tooth that I made to overlap into the belt itself. I'll place this component and then we'll get it situated. Now before I move this at all, I'm going to go right to the pattern and let the pattern place these components. In the drop down underneath the linear component pattern, we'll find a chain component pattern. Now the first selection is to select the chain path. Again, I'll use my selection manager and I'll select my new path, which is the inner face of this belt. We'll accept. We've got three different options for the chain pattern. One is just purely spacing with no orientation updating. The second will update the orientation of your components and allow you to control spacing, while the final one will allow you to create something that resembles a connected linkage by it driving the spacing as well as updating the orientation. I'm going to choose the second as this is the most appropriate for this case. Let's move down and make our selections to get this component in place. Our first selection is to choose the component that we want to use. That's going to be this guy. Next, we need to make our selections as to what is going to be the reference for placing this component. We'll zoom in on this component and we'll make our selections. I'm going to use these edges as my reference. You can also use cylindrical references. Lastly, we need a path alignment plane. I'll use this front plane since I lined everything up with the back faces of the pulleys. Let's zoom in and see what we've got. The first thing that we notice is that our components are in the wrong orientation. So we'll move back and we'll flip them over my spacing, I've set to 1.85 millimeters. This was purely a guess and check. Again, I'm making these numbers up as I go, so I'm just looking for something that looks close to fitting. Now, I don't know how many teeth it will take to get all the way around, so I'm going to use the option to fill path. Now, when we hit fill path, we can see that it wraps all the way around, but it came up a little bit short. In this case, I'll accept the error, or I'll modify this number, to get more accurate. That looks a little better. From here, I'll accept and we're getting a little bit closer. We now have most of the pieces to make this work. I'm going to hide the sketches just so they're out of our way. In this case, I have a bunch. I'll just do this on a global scale. Let's apply the rubber material to this belt. We'll come into rubber, at rubber, and we'll apply this here. We'll do this on the part level. So now what do we have? We have components that will move together. We also have teeth that will move together. And this is what will give us the illusion of the belt moving. Now our only task is to sync the two of these motions to create a convincing visual. Now this can be done one of two ways. One, we could create a rack and pinion mate between one of these teeth and one of these gears, which would link the two motions together. In many cases, this is a good solution, but of course we have a lot of twists and turns in this and oftentimes when the component twists, that is the rack component, you'll see strange behavior in the other components as well. My choice in this case is to sort of manually sync the two of these as it gives me a little bit more room to fudge the numbers. 
Before we go too far, I want to see that my teeth and the teeth on the gear appear to be meshing. So let's check that out. I'll move to my front view so we can see what's meshing and what's not. My first gear appears pretty close. I'm going to say close enough for what we need this for. Now when we move over to the second, we see that it isn't quite the case. Now I can't move the teeth in the belt to adjust because I have them properly here and I can't move this component without moving this component because they're attached by the belt. So what we'll do is we'll temporarily turn off the effects of the belt. To do that, we'll move back to the tree. I'll move back and we'll edit the feature for the belt. I'll slide all the way down to the bottom and I'll temporarily disengage the belt. We'll say OK and now I can independently move these components. We'll get that one lined up. That looks about right. Come down to these components. That looks about as right as I'll get it. Again, just made up the numbers for these gears. And that's about as close as I'll get that one. If we wanted to create detailed animations showing these particular pulleys functioning, I would want to make sure these are modeled more accurately than they currently are. But since we're creating an overall animation, this should be close enough for what we need. Now that I've got everything aligned, I'll go back and I'll turn on the effects of the belt once again. Engage. Okay. Now to make this animation, I just need two mates that will drive the motion that I can tweak in order to sync these values up. To do this, I'll create an angle mate between my first gear and I'll just use the top level assembly plane. Now from here, again, just like our last one, I'll create an angle mate that we can then drive. Now I'll move this back to zero. And in this case, we probably should have done this before we synced the teeth. So we'll move back, readjust our teeth, and we'll create a mate that will drive these components. To do this, I had a long linear section here, so I just added a distance mate from the bottom up that I could push components in this stack. This would allow me to translate an angular value into a linear distance. In order to select this component, I'll temporarily hide the belt. I'll use this vertex. Compared to this one. We'll give this a distance. I'll just leave it right where it is. Now our only job left is to drive these two values in a way that these move together. To do that, I'll use my trusty mate controller once again. We'll select the two mates, the angle and the distance. and we'll create a couple positions. I'll call the first home and spin. In spin, we'll give this some rotation. We'll just go 90 degrees. And here's where we have to sync this value with the linear distance that would be pulled up by 90 degree spin of the gear. Now again, we could certainly be more scientific about this. I'm just creating this for a visualization only, so taking a couple guesses should be sufficient. 
I'll make an initial guess of 120. We'll update that location and we'll let the animation calculate. Now the first thing we see when we hit play is that the gears move backwards while the belt moves forwards. So that's the first thing that we'll fix. We'll move back to our home position, we'll say OK, and we'll edit that mate. All we need to do is flip dimension, say OK, and move back to our mate controller. From here, I'll recalculate. And that looks much better. We'll say OK. And we'll set up a camera. I'll go with my favorite. 24 millimeter just so we get some extra perspective and there we have it the great belt illusion now we can save this video out very easily loop it and make this look like a continuously spinning belt. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this series of tips and as always, I hope to see you next week. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and our blog for more great content by clicking on the links in the description below.